So, I was trying to think of some sort of which way to start my talk and introduce my first slide, but I was sort of at a loss for words. I think it sort of speaks for itself. <coughs> Ghost hands go. <laughs> Today I'll be talking about uh, incidental, or in other words, uh, asymptomatic uh, small renal masses. Um, I'm going to cover uh, the highlights of some of the contentious issues in each of these areas, uh, specifically active surveillance and the natural history of small renal masses, uh, their surgical management, and then depending on how many questions and how much time I have, uh, I may or may not uh, touch on ablative therapy, which is still emerging and we still don't have uh, good long-term data for. The sources of information uh, for my talk are the several of the newest chapters in, in the new Campbells, um, several AUA updates, and uh, uh, fairly extensive literature review. This is a birthday card that I've gotten about 15 times since I started urology. <laughs> it's getting harder. Um, so uh, to start with active surveillance, uh, there's many, uh, is that cursor coming up? No, good. There's many issues uh, uh, surrounding active surveillance uh, and uh, questions that people have, and I'm going to cover each of these in turn. So first of all, then, what are the indications for active surveillance? Really, the, the only absolute indication for active surveillance is patients that have absolute contraindications uh, to surgery due to severe comorbidities. And amongst the active surveillance uh, literature, uh, about a third to two-thirds of uh, patients in these uh, series uh, fall into this category. In terms of relative uh, indications, uh, patients with stable uh, comorbidities that require optimization uh, uh, before going to surgery certainly can be uh, surveyed for a, for a time period, um, allowing them to uh, optimize them in terms of their cardiac status, respiratory status, or, or whatever the issue is. The problem group is uh, those that sort of want elective active surveillance or patients that refuse surgery or can't make up their mind and are otherwise fit for surgery. And this is the group that, that you worry about. So what the first question then is what is the risk of uh, small uh, renal mass that's identified on uh, imaging uh, being malignant? The first paper I want to talk about is this paper by Frank. Uh, they reviewed uh, almost 3,000 uh, small renal masses uh, that were uh, taken out by radical nephrectomy between 1970 and 2000. And all of the uh, pathology was reviewed by a single pathologist uh, for diagnosis, uh, histologic subtype, and grade. And this is the distribution of tumors they found. The vast majority of them uh, were uh, malignant, about 87% of them in total. Um, amongst the benign, oncocytoma and AML were the most common, as you'd expect, and amongst the, the RCCs, uh, clear cell followed by papillary, followed by chromophobe, as you'd expect. They stratified all the tumors according to size, and uh, what they basically found is that the breakpoint was at about one centimeter. So below a centimeter, uh, it's about a 50-50 chance that this uh, mass is malignant. Above a centimeter, definitely favoring uh, malignancy, 77% uh, between one and two centimeters. They then uh, looked at the malignant uh, tumors and, uh, and stratified them according to size and looked at the pathology. And under a centimeter, papillary RCC was definitely the most common. Over a centimeter, by and large, it was clear cell and it increased the larger they got. And then finally, looking at uh, a grade, uh, the larger they got, the higher grade they were. Let's look at this. So one of the challenges uh, with deciding what to do with these uh, masses uh, that you identify on imaging is uh, that unfortunately the best prognosticators we have for renal cell carcinoma is largely based on pathologic criteria, your pathologic stage, grade, and uh, histologic subtype along with tumor size. So the only one of these four criteria that we have available to us with pre-op imaging is tumor size. To add to the confusion, um, it's been shown uh, that there's definite discordance uh, between uh, preoperative imaging sizing and pathologic sizing of tumors. Uh, 
but thankfully it probably works in the patient's favor. Uh, tumors that are, for example, three and a half centimeters on uh, preoperative imaging are actually downsized uh, by about a half a centimeter, uh, so for example, to about three centimeters on pathology, and that's probably because they're no longer perfused on the pathologist's bench. Um, so that being said, a three and a half centimeter on, uh, tumor on your preoperative imaging will actually probably behave like a three centimeter tumor as it's reported in the literature uh, because all the uh, literature is based on pathologic sizing of tumors. Um, the other problems uh, is that post-op uh, upstaging is uh, pretty common. About a third of uh, t clinical T1 tumors will be upstaged to a T3A uh, on pathology. And the other problem is that a significant number of these small lesions are actually quite high grade. About 28% of them uh, in uh, one of the studies I'm going to talk about were upgraded, were, were actually found to be high grade on their final pathology. Uh, I've got to be honest, none of the studies uh, broke, broke down uh, the tumors less than 4 centimeters further to like less than 2 centimeters and 2 to 4 centimeters and looked at whether that made any difference in upstaging, so I can't answer that. So the first study then that I'm going to uh, talk about to highlight these points is this study by Sue. Um, that was published in 2004. They looked at just over 200 consecutive renal masses and about a half of them were asymptomatic. And amongst the asymptomatic masses that were less than three centimeters, 27% of them were high grade on their final pathology. And almost half of them were actually upstaged to uh, uh, T3s. So then the question is, well, does upstaging even matter? This uh, study uh, by Roberts would suggest that it doesn't. Um, they looked at 186 tumors at Johns Hopkins but in the 1990s. All of them were clinical T1s. About a third of them were upgraded to T3As on pathology. The, there was no difference in tumor size uh, between the, uh, uh, the T1s and the T3As. And the five-year survival was exactly the same between these two groups. And it, was actually, it wasn't a significant difference, but it was actually higher in the, in the T3As. So then... Wouldn't it be nice if we could biopsy all these small renal masses and decide up front whether it was a malignancy or not, and that would guide our therapy? Well, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, at the present time, the indications for percutaneous biopsy are uh, suspected metastases, suspected lymphoma, uh, suspected abscess. And then there's, con there's not really contraindications, but controversy surrounding whether or not there's a risk of seeding and how reliable biopsies are. Reliability is a problem. Uh, about 20% of percutaneous biopsies will uh, yield non-diagnostic tissue. And in terms of the small renal mass, it becomes an even greater problem because uh, tumors that are smaller than 3 centimeters, the non-diagnostic rate is actually upwards of about almost 40%. Other factors uh, that uh, play into whether you get a non-diagnostic specimen are the number and size of cores, uh, the presence of another uh, known malignancy, which confuses the pathologist, um, experience of the cytopathologist, and uh, the presence of whether there's cystic components, at which case it's even harder to get uh, tissue for diagnosis. The other factor to consider in terms of sampling error is that based on radical prostatectomy, excuse me, radical or uh, nephrectomy series, uh, we know that... Uh, for lesions that turn out to be oncocytomas, about 30% of the radical uh, nephrectomy specimens will actually have an RCC somewhere else in the kidney. So just because what you biopsy is benign doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a tumor somewhere else. In terms of the issue of seeding, there's only been one reported case report of uh, seeding with a percutaneous biopsy. If you consider the thousands of biopsies that have been done, really I think this is a non-issue. So in conclusion, regarding biopsies, um, at the present time, they're of limited value in determining malignancy risk, especially in the mass that's smaller than three centimeters. And what we really need is improved uh, biomarkers uh, to, uh, to look at the tissue, uh, which would aid in uh, distinguishing benign from malignant um, and aid in our pre-op risk stratification. Yeah. 
Uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't. Thanks. Uh, are there any other factors then that we can use based on the information that we have available to us preoperatively uh, to distinguish benign versus malignant? Unfortunately, there really isn't. Um, at the present time, um, there have been no series. And I'm going to explain this further, but there's no series that have compared the growth rates of but known benign and known malignant lesions, and uh, furthermore, uh, what the different growth rates is of their histologic subtype. Um, what we really need to sort this out is we need a prospective uh, trial small, following small renal masses that at the end of the study ends in, a, in a, all uh, patients having some sort of uh, uh, extirpative surgery so that we have some pathology at the end of the study. At the present time, all the studies involve following small renal masses and only those that are the bad actors actually get excised and so those are the ones that we have the pathology information on. There's some studies that uh, have biopsied small renal masses but as I've just talked about that's not always reliable so we really don't have the proper study to really know what the natural history is of benign and malignant lesions. Right. I actually wasn't, no. So to summarize then malignancy risk, um, basically the larger the tumor, the more likely it is to be malignant, the more likely it is to be clear cell, the more likely it is to be high grade. Percutaneous biopsy is of limited value at this point um, and we really don't really know the natural history of benign uh, versus malignant lesions at this point. So what's the risk of these lesions growing or progressing um, if you uh, continue to observe them? The best study that's published that I could find at this point uh, was a meta-analysis uh, by uh, uh, this gentleman named uh, Chawla, and he took uh, all of these uh, reasonable small uh, numbered series that he could find um, and uh, put all the numbers together, and it amounted to 234 tumors that were followed um, uh, conservatively. And their mean uh, tumor size at the time of presentation was just over 2.5 centimeters, and the mean average, excuse me, the average follow-up was about 34 months. All taken together, what he found is the average growth rate uh, is about 0.28 centimeters per year. There didn't appear to be any difference in growth rate based on the initial size of the tumor at presentation. And uh, for those uh, studies that included biopsies and head tissue, there was no difference in the growth rates between oncocytoma and RCC. Well then, is no growth reassuring? Unfortunately, it's not necessarily reassuring. It's been shown uh, by several authors that no growth doesn't necessarily mean that the tumor is benign. Bosniak in 95 reported on a two and a half centimeter mass that was, had been followed for two years and ultimately went on to be excised and it turned out to be a low grade RCC. And Wheel in 2004 reported on three lesions that showed no growth and were ultimately excised, two of which turned out to be RCC and one of which was an oncocytoma. So no growth is not necessarily uh, reassuring. So when will it metastasize then? It's a key question. In Chawla's meta-analysis, uh, three out of the 286 tumors that were followed ultimately went on to metastasize at an average follow-up uh, period of 34 months. Um, 
the uh, size of the tumors at which at, at which point they metastasized was only reported in two on two of them, and both of these tumors were greater than eight centimeters. One had been followed for quite some time; it was a slow-growing tumor, and the other one was quite rapidly growing. If you go even further back and look at Bell's uh, autopsy-based data, which he accrued in the 1940s. Um, he uh, broke uh, tumors down into less than three centimeters and greater than three centimeters and found a 5% metastasis rate amongst uh, those who had a sm smaller than three centimeter renal mass on uh, autopsy, uh, as opposed to about 70% in those that had a tumor greater than three centimeters. And that's where the so-called three centimeter rule comes from. Amongst the uh, VHL uh, population, uh, Duffy has looked at uh, 180 patients with uh, v VHL. 108 patients had uh, tumors less than three centimeters, and these were followed until they either reached until they reached three centimeters, at which point uh, they were either excised or underwent RFA. And he had 73 uh, patients who had tumors greater than three centimeters, who immediately went on to definitive management. Of the 108 small tumors, uh, the average follow-up was 58 months, and 66% uh, of these went on to surgery because of growth. He had no uh, uh, cases of metastases uh, during the, this 58-month uh, follow-up period. On the other side of the coin, uh, of the 73 tumors that were greater than 3 centimeters, the mean follow-up was about 73 months, um, and they showed a 27% metastasis rate. So the obvious potential flaw in this study is that those that had the greater metastasis rate were followed for longer, um, but nonetheless take it that for what it's worth. So what's the risk then of observing or delaying intervention? Well, basically I've sort of covered this. Um, one of the risks is that patients will develop symptoms while you're observing them. Unfortunately, in the observational series that are out there so far, it's very poorly reported uh, what percentage of patients actually develop symptoms. Chala in his meta-analysis uh, talked about five uh, uh, cases of uh, hematuria, three of which went on to be embolized and two of which resolved on their own. The greater risk though is that these patients go on to have metastatic disease and, and as I've already spoken about, Chala reported on three cases of metastatic disease in uh, his meta-analysis. Um, but uh, thus far, uh, and this is from one of Jewett's uh, recent reviews, uh, there have uh, been no incidental or, in other words, asymptomatic small renal masses uh, that have progress progressed to metastases during observation. And, and this does jive with Chala's uh, data because both the tumors that he had uh, sizing data on were greater than 8 centimeters when they metastasized. So what's the optimal follow-up regimen then? I don't think anybody really knows what the optimal follow-up regimen is, but it, it, if you look at all the, the uh, literature, it seems that the standard of care is to image every six, three to six months for the first couple of years and then yearly thereafter. And the first few points uh, just drive home the, the point that you have to compare apples to apples, use the same imaging modality, make sure you're comparing the same lesion uh, within the kidney and, and measure at the same level. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I mean, that like we did expect my only to change for the time. People, people don't know that. People don't know that yet. They don't have a lot of all of the theory and all the real masses. I would imagine if you're watching it for five years then, going like start to have a certain set of first five years, you know, concerts and such. Let's guys have comorbidities that you don't want to bring in the office. What are some of the other types of things? How many people are monitoring these small masses? Mike and Corona, are you what we do? We pretty much what uh, was recommended. I do uh, generally ultrasound uh, every six months for the first couple of years, and then if there is a minimal uh, growth rate, I call them on a yearly basis for five years, and they generally stop if they uh, require intervention for them. So just to tie up uh, all that uh, talk on small on in, on excuse me active surveillance, uh, basically the, as I've said the right study hasn't been done, but so far <clears throat> it appears that the majority of small uh, solid renal masses are malignant, uh, that the average growth rate is about three millimeters per year. Upstaging occurs in about a third, and whether that's significant or not uh, is uh, still out the, uh, questionable. Um, there's no good uh, preoperative risk stratification tool. Uh, the risk of metastases appears to be low, especially if the tumors are less than three centimeters. And I think observation is safe as long as you have defined endpoints of a maximum size uh, and symptoms. What about biopsy? You discussed biopsy. Do you want to take home messages? I think uh, biopsy may be useful if it comes back as a malignancy. That might change your uh, therapy. Uh, if it comes back as benign, I think all bets are, are still off. There may still be malignancy uh, within uh, that tumor or elsewhere in the kidney. But if you're perhaps smart about it, I'm confident if you're planning to observe anyways, you do an aspiration for a biopsy that comes back as a malignancy, you're not going to observe anyone. Right. It'd be a great candidate for a partial. Right. And if it's negative, then you're observing anyone. Right. Uh, I think the biopsy, most. Uh,
Well, I think <clears throat> that, that mostly comes into play with the, with the patient that is uh, a decent candidate uh, for surgery. Um, and I think you have to tell them that there's really no uh, good therapy for metastatic disease of renal cell carcinoma, that the, the, the uh, number one treatment is uh, excision before it metastasizes. Um, and uh, and then you, you just lay it out uh, in, in terms of the risk of metastases if it's less than three centimeters or whatever size their tumor is um, at the time they present, and you give them the numbers. So I'm going to move on to uh, surgical uh, management then. So basically your options uh, for surgical management of the small renal mass is open versus laparoscopic, radical versus partial. Uh, the first uh, open nephrectomy was done uh, by this gentleman named Simon in uh, uh, 1869 for a ureterovaginal fistula. Uh, the first radical nephrectomy was performed shortly thereafter in the uh, 1870s, and it has since become obviously the gold standard for treatment of renal cell carcinoma. The first open partial nephrectomy was inadvertently performed by Wells in 1884 when he was trying to excise a perirenal fibrolipoma. And the fir first purposeful uh, partial nephrectomy was done by Zerny in 1887 for an RCC. The indications for partial nephrectomy are bilateral tumors, a solitary kidney, tumor in a solitary kidney, uh, a tumor in a kidney with a contralateral kidney being at risk for many of these multiple uh, uh, disease processes. And then <clears throat> in, the, with, in the situation of a normal contralateral kidney, uh, traditionally, it's been an exophytic mass that's less than four centimeters. However, there's now expanding indications uh, to include larger and larger tumors, up to seven centimeters, and uh, more central tumors. And then it does say in Campbell's that uh, uh, occasionally uh, partial nephrectomy has been used for a polar TCC, and usually in a solitary kidney uh, or uh, Wilms. However, that's certainly not uh, mainstream. And I'm not really going to talk about it other than that. So first of all, where does the so-called four centimeter cutoff uh, come from when you're talking about partial nephrectomy? It comes from this paper uh, by Hayfitz uh, at the Cleveland Clinic um, in, which, in which they had 485 patients who underwent uh, open partial nephrectomy uh, prior to 97. Uh, they stratified them according to tumor size and they had four groups initially um, and their mean follow-up was about 50 months. What they found was <clears throat> that there was a significant difference in survival at five, excuse me, <clears throat> at five and ten years uh, between uh, those who had tumors less than four centimeters and those who had tumors greater than four centimeters. And this uh, sort of uh, finding has been uh, corroborated by multiple other authors. So, what are the what are the outcomes of uh, open partial nephrectomy and uh, are the outcomes oncologically comparable to radical nephrectomy? It's a review article uh, by Uzo and Novik uh, published in 2001 on uh, nephron sparing surgery. And in terms of complication rates, the most common complications are uh, urinary fistula at about 7% and uh, ATN at about 6%. Other common complications, uh, adjacent organ injury, uh, infection, bleeding, and the need for reoperation, which usually involved uh, completion nephrectomy. Uh, 
it appears in those studies that did uh, compare uh, radical nephrectomy and open partial nephrectomy that the oncologic outcomes in terms of five-year survival are equivalent. And if you want to take that uh, to a longer follow-up, uh, this uh, paper by Lau, uh, they followed uh, their patients for out to 15 years and uh, found that there was absolutely no difference in survival no matter which way you looked at it, whether it was overall cancer-specific, metastasis-free survival or recurrence-free survival. They were all the same at 5, 10, and 15 years between the two groups. So what about laparoscopic uh, treatment of uh, renal uh, cell car carcinoma. It's well established and proven uh, that uh, the advantages of MIS renal surgery include uh, less post-op uh, analgesia requirements, shorter, shorter hospital stays, improved cosmesis, and shorter convalescence and earlier return to work and normal activities. The areas that have often been debated are, are these, uh, to name a few, and I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. So to talk about cost, first of all, definitely uh, laparoscopic surgery was more expensive than open initially. Um, hospital stays uh, uh, were, were more expensive. However, societal costs were probably less uh, from the outset uh, because of the earlier return to work and normal activities. Uh, in this paper by Guazzoni, he looked at uh, uh, his learning curve and uh, looked at 15 lap radical nephrectomies performed in 2001 versus 15 in 2003 uh, versus uh, 15 open radical nephrectomies performed in the same time period. And they looked at hospital costs. <clears throat> Definitely the lap radical nephrectomy was more expensive than open surgery when he initially uh, started, but this dropped significantly as his operative times came down and more to the point as he stopped using uh, disposables. And the bulk, excuse me, the bulk of these savings was from their uh, the loss, uh, lack of use of disposables and their shorter hospital stays. So what about operative time? In most studies show that uh, lap radical nephrectomy uh, takes longer than an open radical nephrectomy. In Guizoni's, uh study, uh, he, his uh, operative time improved from 2003 to 2001. And uh, even at 2003, he was about a half an hour longer than he was in 2001. I'm going to present a couple studies of, uh, of um, uh, uh, Gill versus Novick that actually Gill's operative times are better than Novick's for radical nephrectomy. So keep your eyes out for that. <clears throat> so what about the risk of port site recurrence? The mechanisms proposed for port site recurrence are direct contamination uh, from instruments and dispersion of uh, malignant cells via the insufflation gas. I don't think that it's a significant risk. <clears throat> to date, there are only case reports in the urologic literature of port site recurrence. There's seven cases for TCC, four cases for renal cell, and only one case uh, of the uh, lap prostates uh, so far reported. The incidence of wound recurrence in open series is about 0.4%. And really, this is probably comparable uh, between the two. Then there's the issue of morcellation, which is becoming less and less of, of an issue, as I think most laparoscopists are moving away from morcellation uh, and, and favoring uh, having an intact specimen for pathology. But I'll talk about some of these issues quickly. The advantages of morcellation are that you have a smaller, uh, that you don't have an extraction incision, at least. Uh, so there's less pain, uh, there's a decreased risk of hernia and improved cosmesis. Disadvantages are the fact that tissue is disrupted and it's hard, possibly harder to get accurate pathologic staging. Uh, and there's the question of whether there's an increased risk of seeding and tumor recurrence. So is, first question then is, is preoperative imaging good enough for staging? Well, I've already spoken to that, and really it's not. The overall accuracy is somewhere between 70 and 90 percent. But as I talked about with uh, uh, Robert's study, upstaging to PT3A maybe is not that important, as their survival doesn't appear to be different. Can you get reliable uh, pathologic staging after morcellation? Uh, this is an interesting study by Landman. They looked at uh, 14 consecutive uh, radical uh, nephrectomies. Uh, they had one pathologist examine the specimen uh, um, intact. 
And then they uh, took the specimen and morselated it in a, in a morselation bag through a mock abdominal wall until uh, the uh, chunks were small enough for them to pull the morselation sac the sac out of the mock abdominal wall with a two centimeter incision. And then they had the second pathologist look at the morselated specimens. What they found was there was 100% concurrence between the two pathologists in terms of diagnosis and staging. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to draw your attention to is that there was one incidence of, uh, of uh, laceration of the morselation sac which led to gross contamination of the field. Um, and there was also uh, one case that the, uh, the uh, pathologist looking at the morselated specimen commented on malignant cells uh, within the lumen of a morselated vein and uh, within uh, uh, some perirenal fat, um, but he, his end conclusion was that this was probably an artifact from morselation and not true tumor thrombus or, or T3 disease. Um, so at the end of the day, he agreed with the initial pathologist. So does morselation affect survival? Uh, this is the main Canadian content of my talk. Uh, this is a series from Barrett in Saskatoon, and he uses morselation commonly. Uh, he had uh, 72 patients who uh, started out with a radical, lap radical nephrectomy. Six were converted, uh, ending up with uh, 66 uh, patients who had their uh, uh, kidneys morselated. And he followed them for an average of 21 months. Um, all patients except for one who refused follow-up were followed uh, with a strict follow-up routine at the uh, Saskatoon Cancer Agency. And uh, he had no port site recurrences and no uh, disease progression within his limited uh, 21 months of follow-up. So oncologic equivalency, is lap radical nephrectomy equivalent uh, to open radical nephrectomy? In short, uh, yes. Uh, there's been multiple studies uh, that have shown uh, uh, equivalent survivals uh, between these two groups. Um, the study uh, by Portis and Perponkosal uh, in this slide, uh, they compared uh, their lap radical nephrectomies to an open radical nephrectomy group, and there was no difference in survival. So what about the MIS partial nephrectomy? The indications for MIS partial nephrectomy are the same as the indications for open partial nephrectomy. However, patient selection is uh, even more important. Uh, traditionally, uh, it was uh, only the peripheral well-circumscribed exophytic uh, masses less than four centimeters that were attacked by this approach. But as uh, advanced laparoscopists are gaining skills and confidence, they're attacking uh, increasingly difficult tumors. Um, these are several tumors uh, that uh, Dr. Gill has a excised. I'm most impressed by this one. It's an AML that he peeled off the renal vein. And in all of these cases, uh, his uh, clamp time was at a maximum of about 40 minutes. So the principles of uh, MIS partial nephrectomy are that you have an open laparotomy set on the back, uh, at the back of the room available if you need it so you can convert. Uh, you should consider putting up a ureteric catheter so that you can instill methylene blue to look for leaks after excision of the mass. Um, mannitol five to ten minutes before uh, clamping. Usually clamping the artery is sufficient uh, for uh, hemostasis and actually some uh, surgeons feel that clamping the whole hylomon block leads to greater blood loss uh, because of back pressure from the vein. Uh, you should excise the lesion with scissors or ultrasonic shears. Close the collecting system in bleeders with intracorporeal suturing techniques. Um, many uh, surgeons use the argon beam for tissue coagulation. Uh, many other uh, surgeons use uh, tissue sealants, and you can, should consider the use of a surgical cell bolster. And then close the defect with intracorporeal suturing techniques using horizontal mattress or a suture use with hemolox or lapratize. And place a drain. So what are the outcomes of the MIS partial nephrectomy? The first thing I'll talk about is the, the issue of warm ischemia. There have been authors that have reported on, on methods of cooling uh, with the laparoscopic approach using uh, an endocatch bag and instilling slush around the kidney or uh, retrograde cooling with a ureteric catheter. And uh, Jan Uxchuk in Europe uh, has uh, reported on uh, actually uh, placing a catheter in the renal artery and infusing uh, uh, cooled saline. It's really not mainstream, uh, largely I think because of its technical uh, difficulty and also the question of whether there's any great advantage. Uh, 
This paper uh, by, uh, by Annie looked at 118 uh, patients uh, with a normal contralateral kidney and a, and a small renal mass. And uh, they uh, had uh, three groups. One group had no clamping. One group were clamped for less than 30 minutes. And the other group was clamped for greater than 30 minutes. At six months, there was no difference uh, in their uh, serum creatinine. One of the uh, potential criticisms of the study is that they had a normal contralateral kidney. So maybe that doesn't really uh, give you much information. Um, but their conclusion was that it, it may be safe uh, um, to clamp for greater than 30 minutes and re recover function. Uh, just one second. Um, when in reviewing the literature, I didn't include these studies, but there are several animal studies out there with dog models where they've uh, uh, actually clamped the renal artery for upwards to two hours, uh, creating warm ischemic time of two hours, and uh, shown recovery of function, um, uh, albeit delayed function, but recovery of function uh, at six months uh, in these dogs. So the window for warm, safe warm ischemic time is probably greater than the 30 minutes that is traditionally thought. Dr. Cleave? Do they not do any renal uh, renogram? That's, that's, that's a good, not in this study, but there, there are studies uh, that have looked at that. The problem with that is that uh, the, any, any decreased function that you see on the renogram, you, you, you can't really say whether it's because there's decreased renal mass because you've done a partial nephrectomy or whether it's really because of the warm ischemic time. So even that strategy is limited. So what about the oncologic outcomes? Uh, this is the head-on-head -head trial, Gill versus Novik. Um, they took 100 consecutive uh, lap uh, uh, partial nephrectomies versus 100 consecutive open partial nephrectomies by Novik. Um, the uh, lap cases, the patients were, were older and their tumors were smaller uh, and a greater percentage of them had a normal contralateral kidney. Uh, the warm ischemic time was longer in the lap group uh, however, they had a lower blood loss, um, a shorter OR time, less uh, post-op analgesia use, shorter hospital stay, shorter convalescence, and there was no difference in the complication rates between the two groups. Uh, amongst the uh, LAP group, 70% of them turned out to have a renal cell carcinoma as opposed to the open group, which 85% uh, of them had uh, malignancy. There was no difference in their uh, parenchymal margin widths. But that being said, there were three positive margins in the LAP group and none in the open group. Uh, and two of these uh, uh, positive margins uh, 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 turned out to be RCC in the LAP group, and they were recurrence-free at two and three years, respectively. In the uh, ALF series uh, uh, and Cavusi, they followed 48 patients uh, with RCC, um, and all of the interop uh, frozen sections that uh, were negative they had one positive surgical margin and that patient was disease free at three years uh, and at a mean follow-up of uh, 38 months they had two recurrences, one of which occurred in a VHL patient and uh, one of which uh, was in uh, the same kidney away from the surgical site. Uh, Gill now reports uh, some five-year data on uh, his series of patients. Uh, he has 58 patients that have five-year follow-up. Um, the mean tumor size uh, in, amongst these patients was 2.9 centimeters. Uh, the vast majority of them were pathologic T1A, and uh, he had one positive surgical margin in this group, and this patient had no recurrence at six and a half years of follow-up. Uh, there was no distant recurrence and only one local recurrence in his group. And he, uh, this table is from his paper, and he just to draw a comparison to the open partial nephrectomies, and really the... Uh, there's, the survival appears to be equivalent and the recurrence rate also appears to be equivalent. So the, uh, one of the few studies that has so far compared the laparoscopic radical nephrectomy versus the open part, um, partial nephrectomy excuse me, uh, is this paper by Perponcosol. Uh, they had 85 lap uh, part, partial nephrectomy versus 58 open. Uh, their mean follow-up was 50 months in the open group and 40 months in the lap group. And they found no difference in five-year survival uh, between the two groups. So the last uh, paper I want to talk about uh, in terms of lap partial nephrectomy is, uh, covers the issue of whether a positive margin 
uh, at uh, lap partial nephrectomy is important. And it's based on a two-surgeon two experience with 511 patients that underwent lap partial nephrectomy. They had nine positive margins or 2% positive margin rate. Two of these patients subsequently went on to a, a radical nephrectomy and there was no tumor found in either of the specimens. Um, seven were observed and of the seven observed, one uh, with VHL went on to uh, die uh, 10 months post-lap partial from metastatic disease. So eight out of the nine were recurrence-free at 32 months of median follow-up. So their conclusion was, was that a positive margin doesn't necessarily mean that there's residual disease and they felt that uh, midterm follow-up outcomes uh, seem to parallel those with negative margins. Um, and they said, and they agreed that longer follow-up is required uh, to draw any final conclusions. So in conclusion regarding surgical management, it appears that uh, MIS surgery uh, uh, is, has definitely uh, uh, has advantages over open surgery uh, in terms of patient recovery. Uh, the cost and operative time issues uh, seem to be disappearing uh, with increased uh, laparoscopic experience. Um, in terms of oncological outcomes, uh, the MIS radical nephrectomy appears to be equivalent to the uh, open nephrectomy. And uh, although that is still maturing, it's increasingly appearing that the lap, process, lap partial nephrectomy is equivalent to the open partial nephrectomy. So I'll spend the last few minutes uh, briefly talking about ablative uh, therapies. This is their preferred ablative therapy for prostate cancer in Spain. Um, the indications for ablative uh, therapy at this time are, are really similar to the indications for active surveillance. Uh, and they are medical comorbidities that preclude um, operating uh, a solitary kidney, uh, a significant uh, a medical renal disease, hereditary RCC. And traditionally, um, so far, uh, exophytic uh, masses less than three centimeters that are lateral or posterior are approached uh, via a percutaneous approach and the anterior and hilar tumors are approached uh, via a laparoscopic approach. So far there's limited follow-up data. Uh, most of the data that's out there is only two to three years of uh, follow-up. Uh, one of the issues is that uh, there's, there's, there's no tissue for pathology after the uh, lesion is treated and that uh, those studies that do report on pathology, the majority of them are via biopsy, and, and I've already talked about the issues surrounding biopsy. Um, confirmation of uh, margins is not possible uh, with uh, biopsy after treatment of these lesions, and uh, the follow-up is relying, uh, in terms of determining success, is relying solely on radiologic uh, criteria. Um, which is uh, a less stringent criteria than, uh, than what we've used for uh, all of the open series. Um, the radiologic criteria for uh, successful treatment at this point is a decreasing size at, at six months and uh, a loss of enhancement of the masses. So to talk about cryoablation first, um, we know that uh, complete parenchymal destruction occurs if you cool tissue to minus 20 degrees Celsius. Um, cryoablation works uh, uh, based on the Joule-Thompson effect, uh, which is uh, if you uh, force uh, liquid nitrogen or liquid argon uh, through a narrow aperture and allow it to expand quickly, it'll rapidly cool the uh, tip of your probe. And actually temperatures uh, uh, approaching uh, negative uh, 200 degrees Celsius have been reached. The goal temperature for destroying uh, tissue is minus 40 degrees Celsius. Um, one of the advantages of cryotherapy is that you can monitor the progression of the ice ball with ultrasound or MRI. Um, and these goal temperatures are actually reached uh, uh, about five millimeters inside the leading edge of the ice ball. So that's why uh, uh, if, you, if you look at the literature, most uh, authors recommend uh, extending the ice ball at least a centimeter beyond the lesion. It's been shown that the double freeze-thaw cycle is more effective in terms of tissue destruction than a single uh, freeze-thaw cycle. Um, and it appears the mechanisms of uh, necrosis are um, both uh, direct and indirect. Uh, direct involves intracellular crystal formation, which disrupts membranes. Extracellular crystals uh, form, which uh, causes an osmotic shift. Um, 
and uh, there's direct solute effects on uh, proteins and lipids. The indirect effects are uh, the malperfusion injury that occurs uh, after thawing uh, with uh, thrombosis of the micro microvasculature and disruption of the endothelium. In terms of outcomes, um, there's up to five year data for the laparoscopic uh, uh, trioblative series and they appear to be excellent uh, survival outcomes so far. Um, upwards of 98%. Um, in terms of the percutaneous approach, we now have about three year data at best and uh, the uh, radiographic success rate appears to be quite good in the 90% plus range. To talk about radiofrequency ablation then quickly, uh, we know that you uh, can cause irreversible uh, coagulative necrosis if you heat tissue to over 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, radiofrequency ablation works by uh, uh, an alternating current at the radiofrequency segment of the electromagnetic spectrum, causes uh, agitation of ions and cells, which is uh, converted to heat due to tissue impedance, and thus uh, causes coagulative necrosis. As uh, necrosis increases, char increases, and the impedance of uh, the tissue increases. As we all know from experience with the Bovi, uh, char doesn't conduct very well. Um, and uh, improved uh, uh, results have been attained with, uh, with uh, multi-array <coughs> electrodes, and that's a picture of one of them with nine tines. Um, uh, because uh, as the way that thing works is the uh, uh, as tissue impedance increases at uh, one of the tines, uh, the current is rerouted to the other tines, uh, so you get more of a homogeneous sphere of tissue destruction. One of the problems with radio frequency ablation is if you heat the tissue too quickly, uh, you get quick charring of the surrounding tissue, and then the current doesn't conduct outside the char ball uh, to the remaining tissue. One of the disadvantages of RFA is that there's no good imaging technique at this point uh, to monitor tissue destruction and, and people are working on thermal and impedance based uh, imaging techniques uh, to try to address this problem. The other cons are the heat sink phenomenon uh, with uh, central tumors, the uh, renal vasculature draws heat away from uh, uh, the area of concern and so you may not get adequate tissue destruction and uh, there's a greater risk of uh, collecting system damage for central tumors with RFA as opposed to cryoablation. So in terms of outcomes so far, the best uh, follow-up we have so far is this 4.6-year uh, follow-up and uh, radiographic success appears to again be in the 90 to 100% uh, 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 range, but again we don't have good long-term survival data yet for either of these modalities. Final slide, just briefly on high intensity focused ultrasound. It's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, there's no good uh, data yet. Um, uh, the way it works is by focusing ultrasonic waves uh, at a single F2 point uh, inside the uh, body from outside. Um, as ultrasound passes through the tissue, uh, its uh, energy is lost and converted to heat. So if you can focus the ultrasound waves at a single point, you can get heating theoretically of the tissue and uh, tissue necrosis. And it works, the, the probes that they've got so far work on a, a similar principle to uh, ESWL. They use piezoceramic elements and a focusing system similar to uh, piezoceramic uh, ESWL machines. Um, unfortunately, uh, so far, uh, tissue disruption appears to be uh, uh, quite uh, variable and uh, certainly it's not ready for clinical use. So. To summarize my entire talk, then, uh, most small renal masses are malignant. Um, they appear to be unlikely to metastasize until they're greater than three centimeters. They tend to be slow growing, and therefore they're probably safe to observe as long as you have defined endpoints and a fixed uh, follow-up routine. Uh, MIS surgery appears to be equivalent to open surgery, and we're still waiting on some of the data for the MIS partial nephrectomy. And certainly uh, RFI, RFA and cryotherapy are being increasingly used. We don't have long-term data yet, uh, but uh, it is a viable option, especially for the patient with absolute contraindication.